Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started today. And this episode is also sponsored by my patrons on Patreon. We got about 40, we got about 700 bucks a month. And so I like to give different examples each episode for why they support. And here's why Josh likes the show. He says, I struggle to find interesting podcast content. I came across her stuff recently and binge listened. I usually don't find most podcasts worth the time, but the topics and discussions were worth every minute. Woo, thanks, Josh. Okay, and so in today's episode, we talk with Sandra Rowe. Um, and Sandra used to work at CME Group um, and now is working on various social impact ventures, specifically this one called You Win, uh, like you and then win, not lose. Um, and uh, we talk about a couple different things. Um, and most interestingly, we talk about uh, the blockchain ecosystem as this place that has a bunch of different uh, impact folks in it. And this is something that uh, I felt is like, oh, there's a lot of people who want to like, you know, do, you know, big social good here or whatever and why is this i get that question a lot like why are those people there um and for sandra from the world that she was coming from it was the 2008 financial crisis primarily um where a bunch of people were there felt the crisis and were like whoa this system needs to change in a big way um then we need to create some macro system change here so that's something that i personally haven't experienced um but makes sense for why the people in the ecosystem um are kind of a little bit social impact or kind of macro systems change focus so we talk about that uh, we also talk about her work with uh, UN Corporation, and the idea there is that there's $9 trillion in these dormant assets, um, and so if you can put them on a registry, that connects them to a global market. Um, and so this is a pretty interesting idea, and they've already done a pilot with it, and it's interesting. One thing that I feel good about, but also weird about with it, is essentially it a, creates a market for all the things, where you take away the inter- intermediary that used to exist, and you say, hey, now you, you know, random person in a developing country, um, um, with various assets, you get access to the big global market, and now you're part of that supply-demand curve there. And I think that that's good, but it's also um, crypto really likes to create a market out of all the things, um, and we'll see how that works in each of these different uh, uh, situations. Um, we also talk about um, how they, their initial pilot was done with a just a normal database um, and a registry, and now they're actually just deciding to use a blockchain, and I asked her why that is, and Sandra said it's because it essentially gives you future optionality, um, where you don't lose very much um, by making it a blockchain. If you do, then you get to add additional layers on top later, uh, value layers, micro um, payment layers, smart contract layers, um, and so you're essentially kind of future-proofing uh, your or giving yourself future optionality against the various value things that you might want to do going forward. So I thought that was interesting and a reason to use blockchain that I hadn't heard of before. And finally, we talked about a classic difficulty with impact startups uh, where you are providing lots of value for poor people, but poor people can't pay you very much money for that value you're providing them. And so how do you, then your return on investment's gonna be less big, and then how do you find the investors who are more okay with that? Um, Then we talk a little bit about that tension as well. Um, And then in addition to kind of her work in the social impact space, we take a little bit of a step back and think about companies generally and how companies, essentially um, how we can change them to be these like human focused corporations. And um, I personally, one interesting part of this is that um, as we were talking about it, I was like, I haven't really interacted very much with kind of like the deeper Wall Street folks, um, but Sandra has, and I wanted to get her take on on this kind of stuff, the kind of human-focused corporation, blockchain, social impact, non-accumulation of wealth, that kind of stuff. And I wondered how what, what her take was on what their take would be. Um, and she said that um, a lot of them are very into it and what have you, and especially ones with kind of lower or with higher risk tolerances. Um, but she said there's also a lot of what she called institutionalization, where you kind of get governed by 
by your context, where you've essentially been in a given context, in a given system, in a given incentive set for long enough, such that you think that it is reality, and then a lot of your actions get based off of that reality. Um, so I like that word institutionalization, not in the mentally ill way, but rather just in the you become the institution that you live in way. Um, so with that, it, I think it's a fascinating episode, um, and definitely would recommend it, and hope you enjoy it. Thanks, everybody, and goodbye. Hello, everyone. My name is Reese Lindmark, and you're listening to another episode of Creating a Humanist Blockchain Future. In this podcast, we take a systems thinking approach to doing good in the world, and we have a couple different series that focus on different system scopes. And today we're focusing on series A, macro systems, where we ask the question, where are we as society headed? And I'm very happy to introduce Sandra Rowe to the show. Sandra was the head of digitization and blockchain at CME Group and is now a managing partner at UN Corp. Sandra, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to chat. Um, so I guess maybe before we kind of dive into some of these cool projects that you're doing these days, let's sort of kind of the higher level and ask you, how do you see blockchain these days and how are you kind of thinking about shaping its future? So when I think about blockchain technology today, um, I really do believe it's the technology that could actually help level set and democratize some of the real social and economic problems that we have in the world. Uh, things that the internet didn't actually accomplish, um, which is really truly giving access to people, not only to information, but now economic empowerment at a level um, that we just haven't really been able to do before. Yep, yep. And, and why do you see it as something different than the internet? Um, I see it as different than the internet because I think there's actually a cultural um, shift that's also occurred. It's not just about the tech. Uh, when I think about the community of people who are in the blockchain space or entering the blockchain space, there seems to be a underlying desire um, with many of the people who are working tirelessly to either build or develop um, the tech and businesses around how do we make this world fairer, transparent? Um, how do we actually level set some of the inequalities that are out there in the world? It can't solve for every social problem, but there are definitely some issues that we have, especially with regards to inequality and um, access that we can use blockchain technology to solve. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you that that cultural shift is happening at the same time. And that's a big reason why I'm here as well. And it's kind of a nice thing where more people who want to do the big shifting beget more people who want to do that because they find other people like them. It's why we're chatting today. Um, yes. And <laughs> <laughs> why though, and people have asked me this, they're like, so why is that? Like, why would, did it become the case that you know, things like, you know, blockchain attracted people who were interested in doing, having social impacts. So from my viewpoint, and this is obviously based on my experiences, um, I was actually in the middle of the financial crisis in banking when that happened in 08 and 09. And then obviously the aftermath of the consequences um, uh, after the financial crisis. But I, I think it really struck um, a core in many people, not just about, you know, um, the fact that our institutions, the banking institutions had failed us, but actually a real question around, is the established way of doing things the right way of doing things? And I think that has kind of uh, tipped off a whole wave of um, reflection. Um, you know, I think there is a lot of dissatisfaction out in the world partially because of the crisis, but I think really this is, it started with that. And I think with blockchain, starting with Bitcoin to start, but really ultimately now where blockchain is, it's, it's really around taking that to the next level. And how do we actually make this a better and fairer world and a more transparent world? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and as you say, that is definitely based in your experience. For, for me, I have no, uh, essentially zero experience with traditional Wall Street. And so um, that version of reality, and, then, and I can't even imagine, it's kind of interesting that you talk about this, um, a shift of the people there that were all part of that crisis. And then now we're like, oh man, how do we make that not happen again? Um, that seems like a good, um, a good incubation chamber for some of these ideas. Um, so with that, um, let's kind of transition over to some of the things that you're actually doing these days. You left uh, CME group recently. Um, 
And now you have two kind of projects that I want to talk about. Uh, the first, could you talk about your work with UN Corp? Yeah, sure. So I left um, CME July 2017 after I made a conscious decision that this technology had immense opportunity to do social good. Mm -hmm. um, and having come from a traditional finance background, I realized, you know, I could take some of my skill set and actually marry that with what was going on in blockchain technology. And the first major project that I joined was UN Corp. And that stands for Unleashing Wealth in Nations. And the brainchild behind this concept is um, my business partner and co-founder, Julius Akinyemi, who is the MIT Entrepreneur in Residence. And the concept behind this is, look, there are dormant assets all over the world. And uh, it was first really, there's a book called Mystery of Capital by uh, economist Hernando de Soto. And it, it talks about the same thing, which is he estimates there's $9 trillion worth of dormant assets around the world. And they exist in the physical world, but because they're not documented, nor are they recognized officially in financial markets, um, it's almost as if from a financial market standpoint, they don't exist. Um, but that is not true, because if you go to any village or if you go to any city, especially in developing nations, um, go to Kibera, the largest slum in Nairobi in Kenya, you will see there is a vibrant economy happening and um, trade is happening every day. So the mission of UN is one to focus on rural farmers, small shareholder farmers, and to help them to not only be documented, um, document their assets, as well as enabling them to find price discovery and being able to negotiate prices through a trading platform. So there's a number of different elements that we will be offering in terms of services to um, our core customer base, which will be rural farmers. We're starting in two countries, uh, Cameroon and Mauritius, where we will be basically, um, we've been working with the government, been mandated to help them launch a physical commodities platform as well as um, documenting uh, their farmers. And they're wow. exciting. Um, there's lots to unpack there. I mean, I think I agree with what you're saying, which is, and it's this funny thing where, um, yeah, we think, and especially, and it can be difficult for people in the developed world to be like, well, why would blockchain be a big deal? Like, you know, um, why can't you just use like traditional banks for this or whatever? And it's like, well, for us, it's easy to open a bank account. It's easy to open a credit card or whatever. Um, and mm -hmm. something like what you're talking about now, it kind of reminds me of salt where you say, hey, um, if you're trying to give people loans, or if you're trying to just incorporate people and their assets into the financial system in some way, how can you do that? Um, and for us in America, we're like, oh, no, but I mean, the bank knows about our house or they know about our car or whatever. And what you're saying is there's actually $9 trillion of these dormant assets that aren't recognized um, that then you can leverage in various ways. I guess, so tell me how much of it is, how much are you guys looking at those, like kind of getting those assets onto the blockchain? How much of it is then using those, in my mind right now, I'm um, thinking about it, it's like using those assets as collateral for future things. But tell me more about that first part, which is getting the assets on it. And then the second part, which is what you can do after you have them on it. Yeah, so absolutely. Look, I think um, when we think about the way we're going to approach developing nations, it's really about a, a, the analogy of leapfrogging from um, nothing to uh, mobile phones, right? They skip landlines effectively. Well, imagine if you could go from having no documentation to basically skipping to the latest technology, which is having mobile phones and blockchain backend to help record your assets. Um, Julius actually did a pilot in Senegal. And just to give you an example of how this can work, um, this was done without a blockchain at the time. So we're migrating all that to a blockchain solution. How dare solution. you? <laughs> I know, I know. But, but look, the, the thesis was actually tested out in, in Senegal, and um, it, it proved to be actually pretty amazing, just the first step. So the thesis of the first step was working with a cooperative to say, okay, let's start documenting all of the farmers. And they ended up with about half a million farmers registered um, with their assets. So when I say their assets, I mean everything from land um, using GPS technology and satellite technology to um, figure out where land is, because guess what? There's no physical addresses. There's no signs that market where one land, one piece of ownership ends and, and another piece of land um, starts. So you've got to actually get creative about how you, quote unquote, figure out who owns what land. Um, livestock, how do you record these animals? Um, lots of livestock, they're very valuable. 
and could also equate to a significant part of someone's um, you know, total holdings, if you look at it from a financial standpoint. Um, a house, uh, machinery, if there is any machinery, all of these things were documented. And then, of course, the commodities that were being produced, whatever they might be. So all of these things were recorded. Um, and just to give you a sense of what can happen when you start recording things, um, Julius found out a few months later that they had received a very exciting news. And he asked, okay, well, what, what happened? Well, they received an order from Saudi Arabia. What mm. kind of order? Well, it turns out they got an order for um, lambs to be delivered to them every, a thousand lambs every month. They had never, one, received a standing order that was, you know, regular. And then on top of that, they never received an order that large. Um, and the question was, well, how did this Saudi Arabian group find you? Well, apparently, they found out that the cooperative had a registry. Yeah. Simple as that. Wow. That's cool. Um, hmm, that's fascinating. So it's, yeah, it is... It is less about it's it's getting all the things on um, the registry, and then once you get it on those all those land, whether it's the the Saudi Arabian people that say, "Hey, we actually want uh, an order for all these lambs every month," that's one version of things. Could you tell me some other versions of things like? Um, and I'm not sure if this is connected to this price discovery thing that you said, yeah. um, which I know nothing yeah. about. So, it's, tell me other things that you can do so, once you have a registry. Yeah. So the next level, the question you could ask is, well, what price did they get for those lambs? Mm. Well, guess what? I bet there was very little negotiation because they were so happy to just receive the cash. Yep. <laughs> the next level up is saying, okay, now we've got buyers and sellers that we can connect through uh, a trust network like a blockchain solution where people can find each other. But how about on top of that, you overlay a marketplace where people can actually transact prices in a transparent manner. I mean, that's essentially what exchanges and marketplaces do help buyers and sellers find a price at which they can trade. Got it. Yeah. So I, and, I can kind yeah. of imagine this like a, um, the way it's in, in existing in my mind right now is like if eBay is to like uh, developed countries to like collectible cars or like random collectible things, then this is to like commodities and developing countries. Is that kind of right? Um, in many ways, yes. We're talking about the fact that today people do trade bilaterally. But imagine you're a farmer sitting on your plot of land somewhere probably very remote and hard to get to. <laughs> well, the one guy or one woman who shows up at your doorstep who's basically the intermediary and says to you, well, I'll give you X cash for this mm -hmm. um, and I'll take it away. You don't have a lot of pricing power. Mm -hmm. And maybe you might know what your neighbor next door got or your neighbor neighbor next door. But the reality is you don't know what the town next door got or what the city down, you know, a hundred miles away got. And, and that with the mobile phone, the advent of the mobile phone and the penetration in a lot of these villages. And I've been in many of these villages where they have no running water, no electricity. And guess what? They all have mobile phones. Yep. Um, that ability for us to reach out to rural farmers is really possible. Mm -hmm. And then to answer the question around why blockchain then, if you guys just did it with a database, well, here's the thing. Um, the applications that we can do on top of a blockchain solution um, and marry that all together with the fact that we're recording data, we're going to have financial transactions, um, you know, why not? Wouldn't, why wouldn't you want to build on the latest tech to mm -hmm. be able to have those applications down the road? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I, that's an interesting argument that I haven't heard before, which is, hey, we could do this on a traditional database, um, but then trying to take that traditional database and put a, a value transaction layer on top of it is going to be more difficult. So why not just build um, a database or a, essentially a blockchain style database at the beginning, maybe with some, you know, proof of authority or whatever kind of um, validation, you know, consensus algorithm on it, and then later pushing value things on top um, later on in the roadmap map will be easier. Is that kind of the idea? Absolutely. And more efficient because we're also talking about things that are probably going to be micro payment level to start. Mm -hmm. So I need efficient payment rails. I need mm -hmm. efficient way of recording. I need an efficient way of identifying people uh, and verifying that. And so you've got a number of pieces where coming together and I haven't even begun to talk about, you know, what smart contracts can do later down the road. Um, this is important that the base layer be as powerful as blockchain technology, you know, is um, and, and evolving to be. 
Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. I like that. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, Ether, Dash, Bitcoin Cash, Augur, Golem, and many more. And this is not your typical crypto exchange. You don't need to create an account or share your personal information, and your funds are never stored on Shapeshift. This means that your hard-earned digital wealth is never up for grabs by hackers or other malicious actors. To get started, visit shapeshift.io, choose the tokens you'd like to swap, input your receiving address, and send your funds. It's that easy. Um, So a question that I have for you then is something that I think about as a kind of a core difficulty uh, within trying to do good for the world is that um, is this question of value and how we represent value. And right now we represent it in terms of money and let's say like some US dollars. And if I am looking around in the world and trying to provide people value, well, if I provide a rich person some value, like one unit of value, then he or she could give me a thousand US dollars in return for that. But if I provide some kind of poor person one unit of value, well, they may only be able to provide me one dollar in return. And so if we're in a market system, it's like, well, I got to kind of, you know, point my uh, point my market and my company at the rich people because they can give me so much more money per value um, than the poor people can. How are you thinking about that with um, with this project? And like, yeah. like, I guess, how are you making money? You know, is, I guess is at the root of it. Yeah, no, I, I think you raise a very good point. I think we need to have a real rethink about our value system and the way we look at the world and how we value it. Um, I have written articles about this. I've spoken about this publicly. I think we need to think about having a social mission and purpose, redefining what it means to be a business corporation. Um, it shouldn't just be about the bottom line. I think there are many things broken with regards to the leadership, current leadership in most major um, companies, which is why so many workers are dissatisfied. Um, the metrics around uh, shareholder return, um, you know, profitability, those things are important, but they shouldn't be a zero sum game. Um, corporations ability to actually solve and help be a, a global citizen or a human citizen inside of, you know, what we live effectively is a bunch of communities is actually critical. And I think there should be metrics there around um, the impact a corporation makes or a business makes to its local society. Um, and, and I think that should be valued. So again, you know, for me, this is around redefining and, and rethinking how do we think of value and returns. And mm-hmm. there are a number of social investing groups now that are focusing on businesses that do just that. It's not a zero sum game. You can be both a profitable business and also do good. Got it. So is that kind of coming back to like you and it's uh, is that are those the kind of people who are I guess is this a it's it's being it was incubated or whatever at uh, with the MIT entrepreneur in residence and with Julian is like are you guys raising money or and, and if you are how are the social impact investors getting in on it or tell me more about that side yeah so um, you know it's currently self funded we're in the middle of talking to people about a seed round um, we've got people the people that were the investors that we're looking for are the investors who understand. Um, social impact investing, um, preferably also understand blockchain as well, which is, you know, there are enough funds now that do that so we can target those. Um, But we want to make sure that there's a cultural shift as well. So the type of investors we're looking for are the ones who are and get what we're trying to do. Um, Yes, we want to make sure that there's a return for everyone who's actually put money and capital into the company. But ultimately, this is around a metric that includes how many lives have we improved helped. What has that conversion been? If, if a farmer was getting $1 out of $10 value of, of a commodity, could we can we make that $2 of value in their pockets? Um, and I'm using dollars just because we happen to be in the US. But you, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I think that that's a, it's a funny thing where you kind of have to, um, you, I've been talking with various, um, exploring with various venture capital groups around this ETH Commons work that I do. And a lot of it is based in the idea that, uh, like one of the key core building blocks of it is that if you quote unquote invest in it, if you give money to it, then you are not expecting 
ROI um, in this current system, but rather uh, you're hoping to exit the whole current like game A system and go towards this game B thing and then, and trying to convince venture capitalists. And then you essentially have to go up that funding tree where you say you need the LPs who don't just purely want an ROI. You want LPs who are aligned with that kind of future facing cultural mission. So it sounds like that's what you're kind of doing as well, where you have to keep on going up the tree until whoever's giving you the money has to be kind of value and mission aligned. Is that right? Yeah. And, and, and I, I think, um, you know, a key point that we need to figure out how to translate and, and tell the story is, for example, more than 50% of uh, many of the sh- small shareholder farmers are women. If you empower and put more money into their pockets, you actually inevitably end up impacting the community. Um, there have been lots of like individual studies done on this, but what I'd like to see is a set of metrics that we could start developing that say, okay, well, if a group of share- women shareholder farmers end up with X and then the community benefits Y, Um, which includes education and um, children being healthier, they live longer, um, there's less, you know, disease, et cetera, et cetera. What is the net impact of that on a given GDP of a country, Mm -hmm. especially ones that are agriculture based? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a powerful thing to, to connect um, those kind of hyper-local uh, kind of developing, you know, people facing things towards the GDP of the country. That that feels powerful. It also reminds me of um, trying to produce these from a pure selfish perspective. Uh, you can you can make the claims, and these are this. It's just very difficult to do this now. Um, but if you say, hey, if there are more people like you, uh, it's essentially if you help people who are poorer than you, then um, they can become more similar to you. And that will be good because then they will demand the same things that you demand and um, they will be able to work on the same things that you're able to work on. And that will be a win win for everybody because you want more people who want more what you want. Um, but that's kind of too much of a macro view I found, um, for, for actual people. <laughs> So I would well, love to know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I would love to know. I mean, we're, we've we've kind of touched on this, but um, you're talking a little bit about you had this great piece in CoinDesk at the end of last year about these kind of human focused corporations. And it sounds like that's what we're kind of talking about here. Could you tell me more yeah. about what this what a human focused corporation is um, and and how it's different than our current focused corporations? Yeah, I mean, uh, ironically, I actually think blockchain technology in the community actually has the ability, even though this is really, you know, cutting edge emerging tech, uh, to bring societies back together Mm -hmm. and maybe even reduce some of the inequalities that exist, right? The extreme inequalities that exist in the world today. Uh, I wrote about, um, you know, a more human corporation because I've spent most of my adult career in uh, large, very large banks and corporations. Um, I've seen good, I've seen bad. Um, but ultimately, net in the end, um, the system itself, you know, the profit driven, bottom line, shareholder return, dividend focused um, system is really broken. Um, it actually promotes the wrong set of incentives in my mind. Um, it promotes the greed. It promotes resource hoarding. And I'd like to see, and and actually a lot of unhappiness and stress. And for me, watching colleagues or even myself feeling that way at times um, is very distressing. And I think there are a number of statistics out there in the U.S. in particular that state something like, you know, 50, 60 percent of most workers in big corporations don't really feel any kind of loyalty or they're unhappy um, or they're looking for another job. Uh, And to me, when, when you're spending that many hours of your life in a given place, it shouldn't be that way. Mm -hmm. There's something kind of broken about that. Yeah. 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 I feel like that is, um, well, I mean, this is, so what exactly you're talking about this, the dividend focus, the greed, the hoarding, um, and then that thing, then creating unhappiness and stress. Um, I super agree with all that. And that is this concept that, and studies show after about, you know, $50,000 per year, you don't get happier when you make more money. Um, and so at that point, but but it's so tough for us to get out of that greed, hoarding, accumulation yeah. mindset um, and towards some version of thing where you say, no, we have abundance here. We don't actually need to push and try to hoard things more and that'll actually make us happier (laughs) 
And, and I think that dialogue is actually starting to happen. It's been around for a while. Um, you know, there are concepts around B Corp or mm-hmm. B Corporations that have been around for quite a bit. Um, and, and that it stems upon like socially driven or social mission driven corporations. So it's not a new concept. But I think what the blockchain community is doing that is really different. It's also a generational shift. I feel mm-hmm. like the younger generations are pushing for a different way of working mm-hmm. and changing the nature of work. Like, what does it mean to work? It shouldn't be just about living paycheck to paycheck. So tell me, tell me a little bit more about because something for me, um, kind of diving into the blockchain ecosystem. I've kind of uh, essentially people that were more like me around the the social impact side and kind of more the startup young side or whatever, I've been more connected with those people, but haven't gone deep on the kind of large banks and corporation side. Um, but you've had experience actually in that world. I'd love to know, like, um, if they were listening to this, or if, uh, or if, you know, one of us went in there and talked about, hey, there's this like, awesome future that could be better or whatever, what would, what would their take on that be? Um, I think it's going to be mixed. (laughs) I think there are a lot of people who, there are some people, I shouldn't say a lot. There are some people where they don't have that option because maybe they're the sole breadwinner Mm -hmm. and they kind of know what they know how to do. And it's, and you know, they like the lifestyle or they, they're used to the lifestyle. So it's really hard to switch out of that. Um, there's a concept called institutionalization, which I think is real, meaning the longer you stay inside of an institution, you become that institution and it becomes even harder to switch out or to think that you can actually break out of that. Yeah. that. Um, um, and, and then there's a minority who are um, a bit more fearless and willing, uh, you know, uh, more risk taking um, and they're willing to give it a try. And there are a number of executives I know who've left very large institutions for the blockchain space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's fascinating. And we'll see, uh, hopefully what we can do on the blockchain side is um, actually actually be successful and say, yes, it, the thing that we claimed was going to be true actually is true. Um, and then hopefully be the actually be successful and then be patient with everybody who is either more risk averse or was, who is in a different context than us or who is more mm-hmm. institutionalized than us. We can say, hey, things are still happening over here. <laughs> like, we're happy whenever you're happy. Yeah, I, I actually I have to tell you, one of the things that I love about this community overall is the inclusive global um, outlook. Mm-hmm. Uh, so many global citizens, right? People who are also from all over the world, all walks of life, all backgrounds. Um, yes, there are definitely, you know, different groups with different flavors, but I will have to say like, you know, how many examples can you think of, of, uh, of tech communities coming together like this globally? Um, anywhere I go in the world now, you know, I can look up various blockchain groups and meet new people um it's pretty cool yep yep it is nice and it is uh we'll see i think that's true at the beginning but then if the world becomes more blockchain crypto-y and then you know 10 percent, 25 percent of people are like that then uh likely some of that will be lost or what have you um but for right now it is nice (laughs) yeah no i agree it's going to evolve and frankly um I think some people are probably already disappointed. It's become yeah. almost too mainstream for some people's likes, um, mm-hmm. especially from people from the early days. Yeah. But you know, things evolve, and I think it's more important that we try to actually get more people in and be as inclusive as we can, um, as opposed to trying to keep people out. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, so another thing that you talk about in this um, the human focus corporation piece is this idea of. Um, full transparency and compensation. Um, and that's something that I personally am super into and I can do it because I, I'm mostly just peer funded through Patreon and stake tree and stuff. And so, and I actually just wrote this big article about here's how much money I made and here's how much of that was after the, you know, the $44,000 per month where you stop getting happier. And so I'm going to give this much money back to charity or whatever. So I've been kind of aggressively fully transparent. Um, but that's not definitely not the status quo. How are you thinking about the full transparency and compensation piece? And are you actually bringing it into some of these, uh, the projects that you're working on? 
Yeah, I, I, I personally believe in that. Um, when I think about what happened at big, large corporations, you're actually told, especially in the banking uh, culture, especially before the financial crisis, but even during, um, you're not allowed to actually contractually talk about your bonus. Hmm. And I always thought that was a very strange thing. You weren't allowed to talk about what you make um, with other colleagues. And let's face it. Um, there's reasons why there's gender pay gaps uh, that we read about. There's reasons why, um, you know, probably people don't want other people knowing about what they make because there's big disparities. Yep. And my question fundamentally is why? Yep. Is someone really that more valuable than somebody else? Yep. And is the delta between the highest paid and the lowest paid really justified? Mm-hmm. Um you know, and, and we could talk for hours about, you know, my issues around uh, CEO pay and board pay and, you know, C-suite pay. It, it, it just, you know, to me has gotten out of control. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I think that pushing for that trans. So, so I guess this is to say it, with you and your existing projects, are you going to do the full transparency compensation thing? So this is where we have to be, you know, I would like to, mm-hmm. if it were just up to me, I would say yes. But I think what I what we want to do is have people um, want to do it, um, not necessarily force people into yeah. it because it's not comfortable for everyone. Yeah. Some people really value privacy, and I respect that. Um, so my point would be is that as someone who's got you know a startup that's looking to pay people properly, I think what we can do is set a range that is not um, uh, egregious, meaning the highest paid to the lowest paid. Um, but what is up to people is whether they want to be completely transparent about what they actually make. Um, I think what you're doing is incredibly forward thinking. Um, most people would not even think to put their, you know, what they make out there to the public. Um, I think that is something that's going to take a while for that mindset shift to happen. But I think we need to go there. Yep. Yep. It was funny when I chatted with my dad about it, just to check in with him before I like published the part article. I was like, should I be showing people like how much money I made? Like how much is in my Wells Fargo and, you know, like my, uh, my, my, my crypto wallets. And he's like, it made him feel jittery inside, you know? So um, it definitely, uh, I can be experimental while people who have yet yeah, been institutionalized in other ways, um, maybe not as much. Um, so with that said, let's go back to one of your, we kind of started at a, a project that you talked about then we went to the higher level around how companies should change and now back to another project um tell me about this uh proof of art thing that you're starting up uh where did it be where did it begin and what are you guys doing with it sure proof of art is uh basically helping remove business frictions for independent artists and uh when we say independent artists we mean actually quite a liberal view of that but we're going to start with film, TV, and um, probably music industry, because those are kind of the big three categories um, we know uh, we can we can approach. And there are four frictions that we see in the market. Um, so creative people are, especially independents, are basically forced to be entrepreneurs and business people in order to make a living to survive, right? To pay the bills. But what if they could actually have some of those frictions removed and they could actually focus on what they do best, which is the creativity piece. So that is what proof of art aims to do. Um, The four categories that we um, look at uh, cover a number of different things, including marketing and distribution, uh, fundraising, um, you know, getting paid, uh, legal contracts, admin, business admin type stuff that is really a pain and and time consuming for independent artists that we've interviewed and um, collected data on. Where we're going to start is really around how do we help fund um, independent artists in a, in a more frictionless way. And we will be using a blockchain-based platform to do that. Um, there will be a number of things that we will look to apply, including smart contracts to automate certain processes. But it really is about how do we um, help artists create more art, create more uh, works of art in a, in, a, in a way that is as efficient as we could possibly make it. Mm-hmm. And the company's based in L.A. It was actually born out of a business competition uh, event at um, Necker Island in 2017. And um, we're now really getting some legs behind it to launch it soon. But um, we're not quite there yet. But uh, there's a lot of exciting things going on in L.A. Yeah. With regards to entertainment and blockchain. Yeah. 
Do you, so that all makes sense. And I feel like, uh, as someone, um, I occasionally make music myself and, um, yeah, they're very, and I actually had a music education startup, um, before I went to blockchain. And one of the, one of the saddest things was, um, looking at one of the top, um, books for musicians, um, on Amazon was something called like 172 legal documents that you need to know. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh no. <laughs> that is depressing. Exactly. Why, is, <laughs> why does this have so many purchases? Um, so uh, that was sad. Uh, so hopefully you're able to fix that. One question that I have for you that I personally struggle with is when you think about these two projects and you have one of them, which is like, oh man, we're like, you know, helping people in developing countries who've been ignored for so long and very, you know, variations on colonialism and all this stuff. It's like, man, that seems like so good and impactful for the future. And then you think about like art and you're like, art is good. Um, and I love art and I wish I could art all the time. Um, but it doesn't feel intuitively like it has the impact. Uh, how do you, how do you think about like spreading your time between those things with that kind of inner kind of impact tension? Yeah, no, I want to, um, be clear about sort of where I come from, which is I am about helping those who are most vulnerable and or outside of formal financial markets to participate in a financial way. So that's sort of where I come from. So for me, the two projects actually are quite aligned in that commonality, mm. but the two are very different. Um, I'm spending almost all of my time on uh, UN, mm -hmm. which is really the my mind going to impact physical commodities as well. Um, overall, uh, it's about helping the farmers, but ultimately what's also missing from today's world is we don't have physical commodities pricing in an easy to consume way at the local level. So if you were to ask me, what is the price of coffee in uh, Vietnam and Cameroon and Ghana? Um, I'm not even sure if you called around that you would get the appropriate local market coffee pricing. And that's how fraction, uh, sorry, fragmented the market is in many physical commodities. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna help bring that together. On the uh, on the artist side, um, I would I am actually just helping to set up some of the framework, and um, I will not be participating on the management team. But we've got a good team being put together to run with that. And I think, from my perspective, that's also very critical. Um, I don't think actually people understand that art and music, um, or sorry, art in general, um, including music, really impacts our lives in ways that promote um, better quality of life. Uh, I'm trying to think of the right words to describe what I think art does. It uplifts humanity. It brings humanity together. Um, I think sports do the same thing. Um, so when I hear people saying, oh, well, art, I don't really care about art, I actually say, wait a second, you know, you may not think about this directly, but actually art has the ability to promote peace and more love and, and more humanity and society, um, I don't think those things should be neglected. If anything, they should be um, promoted because mm -hmm. we have a lot of division and, you know, for some reason, a lot of anger in the world. Um, and, and I think um, promoting art actually helps to combat some of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I agree with that. And I think that there's I kind of think of maybe like a bimodal perspective where you have extreme focus on the like extreme impact side and then also focus on that kind of like the extreme creative forward thinking side. Um, and, and for me, the other key thing is that art can tell if we use this art to tell good stories about the future, that's a key part about the future is not just building the, the technical infrastructure um, and, and what have you, but also the kind of ideological and mindset infrastructure of the future. And art is a, uh, is a great way to tell those stories. Um, so with that, one other wow, funny note. Wow, by the way, um, that that's noticed, beautifully hmm? said. I love that. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, all I'm doing is just uh, <laughs> reiterating uh, words from Karl Marx. Uh, I'm not a Marxist, but he, <laughs> he talks about capitalism, how there's base and superstructure, and the base is like the capital and the technical side of things, and then the superstructure is the ideology and the mindset, and both of them reinforce each other. And so if we're trying to create a new um, thing that's after late-stage capitalism is some kind of new system, then as part of that, we need to tell stories. Um, in any case, the other funny thing that I think um, that I've noticed in this call is when you say you win, uh, I, I, it sounds like the U dot N dot. Um, so that is a, a long-term feedback thing for how to say those words without, uh, without hearing them as the UN. <laughs> yes. <laughs> UN corp or yeah. something. I'm not sure. Um, well, that, 
<laughs> Sandra, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. And look, for all of the people out there who are um, feeling the same way or, or think similarly, I think um, helping each other, um, you know, let all boats rise. I think that would be great. Yeah, all boats rise. Um, great. Well, thank you so much, Sandra. Um, and then for other listeners, if you, well, hey, uh, Sandra, is there any way to get, um, A, you can follow Sandra on Twitter at SRO London. Is that yep. right? Mm hmm. Yeah, um, SRO London on Twitter. Um, and is there any other place that they should find you on the inner I'm on LinkedIn. Um, apologies, guys. I'm not, I, I, I have a Facebook account, but I'm probably about to delete that. So. No, I mean, and, and the uh, and I was also wondering if there's like a place they could look at for proof of art or you in court. But yeah, follow her on uh, on Twitter, and then as you do that, then you will um, learn about her various projects. Thank um, you. And if you want to, yeah, woohoo! And if you want to support me, you can go to patreoncom Rieslindmark. That's patreoncom r h y s l i n d m a r k. And there's also I have a stake tree, which is like that, but where you can support with ETH. So that's stake tree.com slash Um And with that, goodbye, everybody. Bye.